What you will hopefully learn from this presentation is to have mental and emotional fitness. Developing it would hopefully enhance every aspect of your life. In fact, for many of you, it may turn out to be something that you've all, that's always been missing in your quest for wellness and your quest for more satisfying relationships with others. This presentation is based on the work of Dr. Albert Ellis. In 1982, he was, he's named the second most influential contributor to the field of modern psychology and psychotherapy, second only to Carl Rogers. He is generally considered to be one of the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy. His own form of cognitive behavioral therapy was called Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, or REBT. These presentations were developed by me, Ray Mathis. I taught health education for 33 years before retiring in 2007. I retired in part to teach people of all ages how to have better mental and emotional fitness. I realized very early in my career that teaching health education the traditional way was never going to work as well as I'd like. I was never, it was never going to result in the kind of behavioral and lifestyle changes that I would like to see in my students, behavioral and lifestyle changes that would be beneficial for them and in some cases absolutely necessary. That's why I began taking the first to 30 postgraduate hours in Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. That's included the primary certification class offered through the Chicago Institute for Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. I used that training to develop a whole new approach to health education. Over the years, I refined that approach and now involves the teaching of four simple cognitive life skills. Those are the skills this presentation will attempt to teach you. I now represent the Chicago Institute for Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. The Chicago Institute is an affiliated training center for the Albert Ellis Institute in New York City. I speak to students, teachers, and parents, and anyone else who have me at all levels of education all around the country. Much of what we talk about today is also available at my website, itsjustanevent.com. I would like to see all these skills taught to every student at every school across the country throughout their years in school. It wouldn't require any new teachers, classes, or funds to start. This at a time when funds are in short supply. We could start tomorrow. It would be the simplest, cheapest, but most effective way to truly start targeting the real underlying causes of so much that now goes wrong. That goes wrong in the lives of individuals, in relationships, in families and schools, and in our society as a whole. It would also be good for teachers and parents to learn these skills. It would make them more effective at what they do, and it would reduce the stress that so often goes with their roles. The more they teach such schools, skills to their students or children, the more they would benefit from these skills themselves. I also believe that all student teachers should be taught these skills. I believe it should be part of their teacher preparation in their colleges and university. I believe so strongly in the potential of what you're about to learn that I offer to speak for free wherever and whenever people will have me. There's a problem with that all health educators, all health education teachers face. We know more than ever before in human history about how disease occurs, about how our behavior and lifestyle choices can either contribute to it or prevent it. We know more than ever before about how to live longer, healthier, happier, and more productive lives and have more satisfying relationships. People receive more helpful advice and information about how to prevent disease and how to live better, live better lives and about how to, have, how to have more satisfying relationships than people ever have in the past. They receive it in ever more clever, entertaining, and effective ways. Obviously, not everyone has all the information they could use, and sometimes a lack of information does play a role when something goes wrong in someone's life. However, we still have way too many people who start and continue to behave in unhealthy and self-defeating ways, often in spite of knowing better or even having suffered in some way because of their own behavior or lifestyle choices. Most of us know people in our lives who do just that. They're often people we're very close to and whom we care a great deal about. We often wonder why they keep doing things that aren't in fact good for them, especially when they do know better, especially after they have already suffered in many ways because of what they do. We have millions of people who don't do many, th we have millions of other people who don't do many things, simple things that they could do to improve their health and lives, like exercising more, being more active overall, eating better, or simply taking more time to rest or engage in some form of recreation. We often wonder why they don't. We have millions who struggle to have the kind of satisfying relationships they would like, despite all the helpful advice and information available to them on TV programs like Dr. Phil and Oprah, and from hundreds of self-help books and magazine articles that are available in bookstores or even online. When we wonder why people behave in unhealthy, self-defeating ways, often in spite of knowing better or having suffered in some way because they do, there's a simple answer to that question. 
It's an answer you could get from any basic psychology class in high school and college. Behavior of any kind starts and continues because it serves a purpose. People do something because they get something out of it. If they didn't, they'd stop. There's another way to answer the question of why people do what they do. It's that behavior is always goal-orientated. People always have some goal in mind when they do what they do. That includes when they behave in unhealthy, self-defeating ways. Here are some things we all would like. Not everyone believes such things are achievable in their own lives. However, if there were a pill that you could take that would give people these things overnight, everyone would gladly take it. For example, we'd rather live as long as possible instead of die prematurely. We'd rather be healthy instead of sick, be happy instead of unhappy, be successful at whatever we attempt to do instead of fail. We'd rather have good relationships with others instead of fighting and arguing. And we'd rather have as much freedom as possible to live out our lives as we would like. And finally, we'd like to have as much control over our own destiny as possible. Ideally, all our energy and effort would go toward reaching these goals, but no one does that perfectly or all the time. People often have what Rudolf Dreikers called mistaken goals. These mistaken goals get them off course. People get some short-term satisfaction or gratification from reaching their mistaken goals. However, in reaching their mistaken goals, it makes it less likely that they'll eventually get what they really want in the long run. Stryker spent hours watching children misbehave in classrooms. He said that when they did, they had one of four mistaken goals. Attention, power and control, revenge, and finally, avoidance of failure. The important point is that people of all ages often have similar mistaken goals when they behave in unhealthy, self-defeating ways outside. For example, when people argue and fight, they often have the mistaken goals of power and control or revenge. They say and do hurtful things to prove they're in control in some way or to get even with the other person. But in doing so, it just makes it harder, it just makes it harder to have the kind of relationship they really want in that, with that person in the long run. One additional mistaken goal that is common and widespread is withdrawal, avoidance, and relief. Many of the unhealthy things people do have the mistaken goal of withdrawing from or avoiding some unpleasantness in their life and getting relief from the feelings that often go with it. The reasons a teenage boy might start to smoke could be to connect with friends, to prove a point with his parents, or to get even with them in some way, but the reason he'll probably continue to smoke is that it gives him relief from stress or calms him down when he's angry. When I was working on my master's degree in education, I did a st statistical study in an attempt to see if there were any correlations between unhealthy behaviors like smoking and the feelings people generate. I found a perfect correlation existed between those who reported smoking the most and those who reported being angry the most. The angrier they reported being, the more they reported smoking. Many people use alcohol and drugs to withdraw from or avoid unpleasantness in their life and to get temporary relief from the feelings that go with it but they risk becoming addicted and having all, all the health and other problems that can go with that. Others use eating an abundance of their favorite foods as a way to elevate their mood. They often gain weight without realizing it, sometimes to the point that it becomes a chronic threat to their health and life. A young girl who stops eating to lose weight might learn that not eating and exercising a lot gives her a false sense of control of her life and gives her some relief from the anxiety she generates about all her life events. This at a time when her life started to feel out of control in so many ways and she struggled with anxiety. Some might be quick to have sex with someone in an attempt to get someone's el someone else's love and get relief from the loneliness they feel, only to end up with an unintended pregnancy, an STD, or to find out later that they were used for sex and, end up, and then end up feeling lo even lonelier than before and feeling guilty and ashamed on top of it all. There's actually an ironic parallel between what we do to try to make a young child feel better when they're upset and the unhealthy things adults do try to, to try to make themselves feel better, even if their relief is only temporary. For example, we put a pacifier in a baby's mouth when they're upset, and we have adults who put a cigarette in their mouth when they're upset. We sometimes give baby, a baby a bottle when they're upset, and we have a lot of adults who turn to a bottle of alcohol. We often offer children sweet treats when they're upset, and we have millions of adults who, are f who use food to help elevate their mood. We buy children toys to make them feel better, and we have millions of adults who compulsively shop, collect things, and even obsessively hoard. Finally, we sometimes pick children up and hold them to make them feel better, and we have many adults who try to pick someone up or get picked up for the purpose of having sex simply to, because they're lonely. The important point is that a large part of what gives purpose to unhealthy and self-defeating behavior is that people generate what is called a dysfunctional amount of emotion in response to their life events. This dysfunctional amount of emotion then acts as a driving force behind any behavior intended to achieve any mistaken goals they might have. Please check out 
Mental and Emotional Fitness Part 2 for a follow-up on the topic of emotions. And we hope you will opt to view the other short videos that follow. Remember that you can find most of what we talk about at www.itsjustanevent.com. You can also read about how to develop mental and emotional fitness in the book Ray Mathis, or I wrote about, about it, entitled It's Just an Event. It's your choice how you want to feel. That book is available at Amazon.com, at www.itsjustanevent.com, and through the publishamerica.com's online bookstore.